healing isn't about let me take myself back through the circumstances it's let me go to that inner child who's still frozen in time somewhere and give that little one the opportunity to express christine hassler is a master coach with 20 years of experience in psychology she's the author of three best-selling books and host of the top rated podcast over it and on with it check out this incredible conversation with the amazing Christine Hassler. You know, I'm very grateful to have you here. I've been talking a lot about relationships and the impact that it has on our health, our success, all the things, mm -hmm. but it's something that we don't get a lot of education on, which is crazy. But being that our health is so deeply impacted by our relationships, mm -hmm. it deeply impacts our well-being. I would love to start off by talking about that first, the big picture thing. Why? Does our relationships impact our health so much? Yeah, well, I th and I think we do get education. It's just miseducation. I mean, the education we get is what our parents do, or what we see on TV, or what we're told. So we're educated or programmed in a way that usually doesn't serve us. But if we look at relationships, so intimate relationships, or friendships, or even parent-child relationships, human beings we are wired for connection. We are interdependent beings. Connection and belonging are tied to survival. So if we go back to our very primitive days, if we didn't have a tribe, we die. Yeah. So not feeling connected, not feeling like we're in healthy relationships can push up against that survival fear. And it can be super subconscious, you know, not know like, why am I experiencing so much anxiety over this breakup? Or why am I experiencing so much anxiety when my partner and I stress, uh, fight, or when my kid isn't listening, or when I feel like I'm alone? Well, it's because it's pushing up against that. Oh my gosh, do I belong? You know, am I going to survive here? So that's like the foundational thing for why we need to look at why healthy relationships are so crucial. And like you said, the problem is people just don't really know how to do it. You know, and, and no matter, and I will speak, for, I'll raise my hand here, even with the education and even with all the personal growth work I have done for 20 plus years, and my husband, who's also deep in this work, sometimes in relationships, we look at each other and go, have we ever done any work? Like, have we ever had a day of therapy? We're acting absolutely ridiculous here. Why is it so hard? Because man, relationships are mirrors. They are such mirrors for the things that we don't want to look at. And so they really illuminate for us the issues that have been holding us back for years and years and years. And often those issues that go back to inner child wounding have been impacting our health cumulatively mm -hmm. over time. I mean, I'm sure you and I can agree that most, I mean, dare we say all, health issues can be tied to something emotional or something traumatic that happened in the past. The body keeps the score. I mean, the body and the mind are so closely connected. So when we can look at relationships as an opportunity to heal, an opportunity for things to be illuminated that maybe we haven't experienced before, it gives us that opportunity to take that mirror, turn it back on ourselves and look within and do some healing work that we've been needing for decades. Yeah, yeah. Just even you flipping the switch in my mind and for all of us, hopefully, that our relationships are so impactful on our everything in our life, we've got to really understand it, this is tied to our survival. Yep. Like we are hardwired deep, deep, our genes, our relationships are about survival. Like we don't think about that because everything's so fancy now. Yep. You know, we've got electric cars and we can fly and all the things. We can't, <laughs> I mean, we can't fly without, you know. Yeah. And we seem so evolved, mm -hmm. but when it, what it really boils down to is that there's a deep, deep primal need for each other. There is. And, but that how to do it, and I'm so glad that you brought this up, it really is a miseducation. You know, we're getting fed this programming, right? Mm -hmm. Television programming repeatedly on this kind of romanticized version of what this stuff should look like. Yep. And so that's where we're getting our training. I know that's where I got my training. I didn't learn anything about building a healthy relationship, any kind of like academic construct. And even with that, it's still probably going to be miseducation. And so this is why this conversation is so important and why you are also so remarkable. Mm. You know, you have a a tough story in the context of relationships at a phase. Mm -hmm. But what you've created recently, you know, to see this, and I've just been sitting back watching like, <laughs> this is amazing. Like you are really about that life. The stuff that you talk about and teach you manifested that 
Mm-hmm. And to have this at a point when some people are just like chalking it up to like, forget about it. Yeah. And having your beautiful daughter as well. Yeah. Recently, it's just like, it is so special. This Nobody said it's easy, but no. you, you've actually demonstrated what's, what's possible for us. And so I want to dig in here now mm-hmm. and talk about how do we go about this? Because if we're wanting to improve our relationships, if we're looking for a healthy relationship in an intimate context, for example, mm-hmm. we're living in an age of dating apps and social media and just like our attention is so scattered. And what do we do? I know this is a big question, <laughs> yeah. but what do we do? What should we start with to, to have those healthy relationships we're looking for? Yeah. Uh, well, first, I'm so glad I'm done with dating apps. Oh, my gosh. I did not enjoy those at all. But they have they they have a purpose, and I know many people who've met on dating apps, so they they have a purpose. So where do we start? Well, at the beginning, really. I mean, I, any relationship, whether it's somebody in relationship and they're having trouble with their partner, they're fighting um, patterns, the polarity's gone, or someone's looking for a relationship, where I always start is childhood, because it's just where it all begins. Like we said, it's where the miseducation begins. And back to what we need as humans, we need that survival and we need to feel loved and safe. And if we survey, you know, if we walked down the street and talked to 100 people and said, did you feel completely loved and safe as a child or even consistently loved and safe as a child? Because secure attachment isn't about perfect parenting all the time, but it's about that consistency and repaired. I bet out of those 100 people, five, and I'm being generous, would probably say, yeah, I felt really loved and safe as a kid. I felt like I could express myself. I felt like I had good boundaries. I felt like I could be who I am. Unfortunately, a lot of us have inadequate parenting. And this isn't about throwing our parents under the bus. This is about just being honest with, as humans, we don't get a lot of education or support on being human. And so from a very, very young age, we start to believe things about ourselves that aren't true. We start to believe something like, well, in order to be loved, I need to be good. You know, in order to get my dad's attention, I need to be really good at school or really good at sports. You know, in order to make sure my mom is happy and doesn't have a meltdown, I need to be entertaining or I need to take care of her. Or in order to be safe in the world, I need to just be quiet because my house is very chaotic and I don't want to ruffle any feathers and I'm just waiting for the next egg to drop or shoe to drop. (laughs) I combined walking on eggshells and shoe to drop in that one. And I'm bracing myself, right? So... Because of what happens or doesn't happen to us in childhood, we come up with these formulas about what we think we need to do to be loved and safe. And the truth is, we shouldn't have to do anything other than be ourselves to be loved and safe. You know, every human, especially every child, deserves that. Again, unfortunately, that's just not the way it is right now. So we have these unmet childhood needs. And I could go on and on about the list of unmet childhood needs that we just carry around. And and time doesn't heal all wounds. I hate that expression. It just doesn't. So we grow up and all of a sudden we're 35. And we've really never dealt with the fact that we really, really wanted our father's attention. And he was maybe physically there sometimes, but just emotionally wasn't available. So then we find ourselves dating emotionally unavailable men over and over and over again because we're looking to resolve that unmet childhood need. And we look for people that look like our parents, not physically look like them, but look like them in terms of how they behave and relate to us. So the inner child goes, oh, why well, didn't get this from dad, but hey, you, you make me feel a lot like dad does. Maybe it can be different here because the inner child is, is so wants to be loved by his or her parents. Like it's so seeking that love, safety, and acceptance that we've never gotten. So it's it, back to where do we begin? We begin by looking at, okay, what didn't I get as a kid? What needs were not met? What developmentally did not happen for me? Because if we look at Erickson's stages of development, there's some psychosocial development that we all need to go through that just doesn't happen for a lot of us. So we ask ourselves that question, what needs didn't get met? And how am I looking to a partner to fulfill that for me? Because this is the number one problem I see in relationships is it's like you and I get into a relationship 
it's all the you know infatuation hormones are flying amazing phase i got my rose colored glasses on i'm ignoring red flags it's awesome and then time goes on and things start to happen and i start to project all the things that i never got on you and expect you to give them to me so we go into relationships with a lot of expectations a lot of expectations and not a lot of responsibility and so much of these expectations are subconscious you know one of the things that um, couples come to me and and my husband and i when when we do couples coaching they come and they say the polarity in our relationship is off we need to fix polarity and there's this huge thing on masculine and feminine dynamics and she's too much in her masculine and and he's too much in his feminine that was a big thing that was said to me in my my single years is christine you're too much in your masculine that's why you don't have a man you want an alpha man, you got to be in your feminine. And I was like, what, do I got to wear a flower crown and dance around the moon? Like, what do you mean I have to be? Like, it, it made no sense to me because I didn't feel that, you know? And what I see with couples is it's not about polarity at all. It's about inner child wounding. It's like, we're, we'll use that masculine feminine example. So the woman in the relationship, she might be in hypervigilance, which could appear masculine. She might be controlling. She might be nagging. She might be criticizing. That's not her being in her masculine. That's her being in hypervigilance. And hypervigilance is a trauma response that comes from being scared, that comes from being out of control at some point, thinking you could trust something or someone and it it not turning out that way and being hurt and scared and then I've got to like control everything. And so she's not in her masculine. She's a scared little girl that's trying to get control. And the man is not necessarily in his feminine. He probably as a kid was shut down a lot couldn't express his feelings was told he needed to be strong or was told he was to this or to that or or whatever and so he's not necessarily in his feminine he's just terrified of rejection and hasn't been respected and appreciated as a little boy or a man and so he's just kind of like shut down into that hypo arousal you know though she's in the hyper he's in the hypo and people try to work on the polarity and i'm like you can try to like work on the polarity all you want but until you get to the inner child at, that's underneath all of this and give them what they need, you're going to constantly have those battles in your relationship because you're not going deep enough. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Absolutely. Can you elaborate on inner child? Because sure. that term can seem a little bit strange yeah. or also just even in our culture, something that doesn't quite make sense. Yeah, and I, I, I'm glad you asked me that because inner child isn't some woo-woo, you know, California, let's like talk about our chakras and our inner child thing. It's, it's not that at all. It is a psychological reality. So if you think about us as people, we're, we're naturally multiple, you know, not multiple yeah. personalities, that's a disorder, but we're naturally multiple. And, and our childhood is where all the computer programming gets put in. Mm-hmm. It's where we form our beliefs about the world. And looking at our nervous system, for example, our nervous system from zero to seven, is that's when it's being formed. And until seven years old, we're, co- we're, well, we're always co-regulating with people, but especially until seven, we're co-regulating mostly with our parents. So we are, we are like blank slates. I mean, I do believe everybody comes in with their unique expression, their unique karma, and things that just make people unique no matter what their nature, nurture, situation is. However, there is just so much that happens in those formative years that imprint us. So the inner child is the part of us that had to go through those experiences. And it's also the really magical, spiritual, intuitive, playful side of us. If you just look at the archetype of a child, a child that's in a safe and loving home, they're going to be curious and playful and totally autonomous and discerning and connected to their intuition and connected to animals and nature and all those things. So the the, the archetype of the inner child and the healthy inner child is a beautiful thing. But what happens is we get get kind of fragmented. So um, imagine that at five years old you were abused you know maybe it was one time maybe that's when it started and it was multiple times so that doesn't just go away (laughs) there's a there's a part of us the inner child part that just sits with that and holds that pain and it gets not necessarily locked in but it gets shut down and really really tucked away and so this this part of us that never really got loved and healed through that 
just has to kind of like sit there and wait for us as the adult to go back and do something about it. But the problem is most of us don't. Mm -hmm. Most of us think, okay, well, that was in the past. And a lot of people are afraid of doing inner child work because they don't want to relive their trauma. And we can bookmark that and come back to that. Um, however, like I said, time doesn't heal all wounds. So often there's this child, this part of our psyche. It's like you can, the best way to think about it is it's sort of like a big part of your memory and a big part of your past and your experiences. And it acts out subconsciously. So let me give you an example. Let's say that, um, well, I can use my inner child as an example. So sometimes as an adult, I would go to social situations that I knew were safe, that I knew like the people were going to be nice. No one was going to tease me or put me in a corner or go and whisper about me. Uh, there, I, nothing was going to happen to me physically. But I'd walk into these situations with so much anxiety, so much anxiety. Like my reaction did not match the reality of the situation at all. And that's because my inner child, who was bullied, who was, you know, the I hate Christine club, who didn't fit in, who was a late bloomer, who always felt separate and awkward, who was talked about, was still hanging out in my psyche going, danger, danger, this is, this is not a good situation. I've got to rev up some anxiety right here because this is not safe. So it wasn't my present day self that was reacting to that situation. It was that inner child part of me that hadn't fully healed from that experience. And as adults, we just try to push through our pain. We try to push through our anxiety instead of actually going inside and going, huh, like what is this message here? Why do I have anxiety about this? Or why do I sabotage relationships every time people get close to me? Or why do I procrastinate on doing the things that I want to do? Or why am I still people pleasing even though I'm building resentment inside? And so often it's because there's still an inner child who's trying to get needs met but doesn't know how to do it in a really healthy way. This is so fascinating. You know, I really, it, it, within this, this is tough. This is tough. Just thinking about my little brother and sister mm -hmm. and the different environments, that zero to seven age bracket. And yeah, my little brother, he he's had this kind of residual thing with me, just like I had some advantage over mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. And with you sharing that in the way that you did, I did. Mm -hmm. I stayed with my grandmother, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Yeah. So up until I was about seven you know, for three years and I had safety, I had certainty, I had the feeling of significance, I mattered. And also again, like that, the resonance with those nervous systems in that household, you know, it was a lot of love, a lot of, you know, my grandmother, my grandfather, they were an, ent an entity. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying that, of course, they didn't have any conflicts, but they, they presented as a unit mm. of, of, for me, like it represented like the epitome of love mm -hmm. there was like love isn't all sweet and nice also there's discipline there's like yeah. standards you like all of these qualities were there and i was just picking it up in that environment because the other environment is one that was very volatile there's a lot of violence in the household there's constant yelling there's physical altercations there's drug use there's a lot of alcohol abuse yeah. there's this is our daily life and so and not to mention outside the door in a lot of these environments where yeah. there's, you know, there's gun, gun violence and there's, you know, crack house and all these different things. And so being in these environments, for me, I'm just, I'm taking that with me and I don't even realize it, that I have some of that imprint, yeah, right? Absolutely. But at the same time for me, I've always felt like with my little brother and sister, okay, this is what, this is the conditions we're in, mm -hmm. but we're gonna do better than this. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a collective understanding. I never said the words, I just, felt like they're seeing these asshats acting crazy and we're not going to do this. Yeah. But they follow those patterns. And so like this really cracked me open a little bit more today and just thinking about how important it is with those inputs, especially again, we're in a dip literally our brains and our nervous system are very different. Like yeah. we're kind of, you know, some of the research indicates like we're more in like more theta brain frequency, which is like we're very impressionable. This is why we're the Easter Bunny, you know, Santa Claus, 
really a guy's coming down the chimney and like all of the night, like all this, but it's very real. Yeah. And then we start to quote, have reality set in later, but that is a part of us. And so even, and this is the part I want to swing it back to you, even as I'm sitting here and thinking about these things, they exist. They exist for me in my mind, mm -hmm. in my spirit. So the term that we've put on this is an inner child. Mm -hmm. That is a very real phenomenon and nobody else understands your inner child like you do because you're the only one that truly experiences those experiences. Yeah. And so with that being said, you mentioned that self-inquiry, right? Being able to ask some questions, but you also mentioned people not wanting to do this work because they don't want to relive certain things. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, I will. There's a couple of things you said I want to unpack a little bit. So with your siblings and that example. So growing up in chaos like that, children, oh my gosh, children have to endure things that they just can't, you know? And so they have to go into this, this survival part of their brain and it really shuts down people. You know, it really just kills spirits in so many ways. Yeah. And so, for example, growing up in a chaotic house is gonna create an insecure attachment style, if we tie this back to relationships, is gonna create an insecure attachment style, specifically, most commonly, a disorganized inner attachment style. So if we look at attachment style, there's secure and insecure, and within insecure, there's anxious, avoidant, and disorganized. And that chaotic, it creates this disorganized attachment style where you kind of have this come here, go away, Thing with people it's like you want people but you don't you want closeness but you don't you can't get a grip on life feelings are just really big so you need to numb you know you need to do something because you had no regulation as a child so or do something really big for attention yeah it, it, exactly so uh, you know I I have so much compassion for the human experience and you know I've coached thousands of people at this point and and so many adults come and they get so frustrated because they can analyze themselves and they know they should be doing better and they know they should have more confidence or they know they shouldn't procrastinate or they know they shouldn't, shouldn't sabotage or shouldn't drink or shouldn't cheat or whatever but I'm like but there's a part of your brain that just can't <laughs> like there's a part developmentally that you didn't learn it's like when we learn grammar, we learn it in a certain way so that we can communicate in a way that people can understand. And there's so many things that happens in people's childhood where they miss big things like how to conjugate a verb. And, you know, and then they just have trouble communicating or relating in this metaphor to other people. And so our childhood can't be used as a scapegoat and our parents can't be the blame for all the, the or the reason we have don't have what we want in our life. You know, it's not about blaming parents, it's about having compassion for parents too. And we'll get to spiritual bypassing and forgiveness of parents. Um, but it, it's having just so much compassion for our human experience, especially our childhood. And like you said, no one knows our inner child like we do. And so many people just have no idea how to connect to their inner child at all. So I'll, I'll wrap how to connect to your inner child in answering your question about, okay, how do we deal with our inner child if we don't want to relive trauma? So... I don't believe in reliving trauma at all. I don't think it's useful. I do believe there's huge value in somatic experiencing, in allowing ourselves to release things from our body that we've been holding on for a long time. And you don't necessarily have to remember it. I was working with a client who had repressed memories of sexual abuse come forward 20 years later, because she finally felt safe enough to have those memories come forward. And we were in session. She's like, oh, gosh, do I have to remember details? And I said, ask your higher self. Go inside. Ask your higher self because we all have a higher self. Do you need to remember details to heal? She went inside and she asked. She got a very clear no. She said, how am I going to heal without remembering the details? And I said, well, you know what happened. That's enough. And you, knowing that it happened and giving yourself permission to remember that it happened is going to give you access to express the feelings you never got to express. So we can go back to a time in our life and give ourselves, especially with a counselor, a coach in a safe environment, give ourselves permission to feel the feelings. To Because if, if you look at something like abuse, for example, 
when kids are abused, they may cry a little bit, but mostly they have to freeze and take it. You know, kids that are abused don't then go get to process their feelings and, and have a safe adult hold them when they cry or let them express their anger or their shame or anything. It just yeah. all just gets sucked inside. So healing isn't about let me take myself back through the circumstances. It's let me go to that inner child who's still frozen in time somewhere and give that little one the opportunity to express. So when I do inner child work with someone, first I create a really safe container. Never do it in the first session. Like I, I need rapport. I need them and all parts of them to know that they're safe, that they have a non-judgmental person with them. And it can take a while for the inner child to even feel safe enough to come forward. I know for me, when, when my first coach, Mona, took me into inner child work, I just I was like, where is she? I, I'm broken. Like she's, she's dead. I can't find her anywhere. I have no access. And I didn't have a lot of memories either. There was a lot that I just really, really forgot. But over time, and we can talk about some techniques, over time, I started to see her in visualizations. And the first really profound visualization I had, she was standing behind a tree with her arms crossed. And I kept wanting to see her. And I kept trying to walk around the tree. And she kept turning around the tree so I couldn't really see her. And so in this visualization, I just sat down and I said, I'll wait. I'll stop chasing you. I'll wait till you can come to me. And then eventually in this visualization she did and that was the beginning of my rapport and relationship with her so often the first step is just like creating that connection like going back and realizing oh there is still a little me in there like it 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 does exist and we have to be very patient and gentle with allowing that part of us to to feel safe enough to come forward and that like i said can really take some time but when it does then that's when we can go back again with a trained person or even on our own. My husband and I teach an online workshop for people on how to really go back and heal your inner child because it's such an, such a critical part of healing and relationships as we're talking about. Um, but when you're doing it, it's it get, you allow yourself to go back in time but not go to the, the abuse or the hard thing, but to the age where you feel like you didn't get to express something and be that loving person and say, I'm here. What are you feeling? What do you want to say? What are you believing? What are you making this mean? And when we can give the child the, the healing that they never got to experience, the emotional expression, then it's like these, these things don't have to become so lodged inside of us. And the inner child starts to be, realize, oh, wait, there is a loving person who wants to hear what I'm saying right now. So it's, it's, it's beautiful work and it's, it's simple work too. It sounds really complex, but it's actually quite simple and profound. Mm-hmm. Um, I would imagine there's all kinds of ways that we would express. Yeah. Right. It's not just a cookie cutter. Okay, you're you're allowed to cry or right. to to yell or to just articulate how you feel. There's going to be a wide spectrum of expressions if we're allowed that space to do it. Oh yeah, it might be um, dancing. It might be laughing. It might be drawing. You know, the inner art is such a fantastic modality for the inner child. Um, there's so many. It might be sounds, no words. It might be asking for a need to be met. And there's there's so many things that can. There's no one road to healing. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody's yeah. different, and you'll find your way. But I want to just reiterate again: it is so possible, and in my opinion, better to do this work without taking yourself back and re-traumatizing yourself. Like you've been through the experience already. This isn't about reliving the experience. It's about giving yourself the emotional release around the experience. You know, because I see this with my daughter. She's 20 months old right now. And I'm really learning to just hold space for her big feelings. Like I, I, I do my best not to say it's okay or try to calm her down. I let her have her feelings and acknowledge them. Say, I really see you're upset about this. You're angry. You're safe. I'm here. And then it's done. Then it's just done. And she's fine. And that's that's what the inner child needs, a safe space to just express in whatever way they want to express and be received with unconditional love. Mm. And the problem I see so many people get into when doing work with younger parts of themselves is they go back with reassurance. So they go back and say, you know, it's okay, Sean. Like your parents, they were doing the best they could. 
You know, they really were. Your mom was really stressed out. You know, your, your dad had his own abusive mother. Like they were doing the best they could. And it's okay because you're going to meet a wonderful woman. You're going to have kids of your own. You're going to have this successful podcast. Like it's all going to turn out okay. That means nothing to the inner child. Because for them, they're still in that moment. And it feels dismissive. So we have to make sure we don't go into reassurance and this kind of like, it's all going to work out type of thing. It's really honoring where they are and what they need in that moment. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned some other important tools as well. And you mentioned forgiveness. And that was really, that that changed everything for me. Mm -hmm. You know, Um, of course, being able to perspective take as well, whether it's within and looking at my different stages or looking through from other people's perspective to the best of my ability. But I used to have this reoccurring dream when I lived with my grandmother. And even after I moved back with my mom, and I've never shared this before, but it would be this, this was my, my brother's basically like five years younger than me. And it was my mom and she was holding him and I would be trying to get to her. And every time I would get close, she'd go through another door. And I'm just, and it kept happening. I could never get to her. And she got further and further away. Wow. And I just, I longed for my mom, even though I was now in this kind of safe environment, and there was so much beauty in this place. I still longed for her. And I can't remember my relationship with her prior to moving in with my grandmother, mm-hmm. but I know that obviously I was bonded to her. And I felt like when she would be holding my little brother, like she wasn't holding me, you know? Yeah. And, but my mom because of the environment that we were in because it was a reframe for me as well so it's the part of acceptance it's the part of you know being able to express myself and how i felt at the time but also understanding why she did some of the things that she did as well and where they were coming from Mm -hmm. right and so we were in a volatile environment we were in a place where i could die i could Mm -hmm. die in a certain interaction outside that door Mm -hmm. and she wanted me to be tough she wanted me to be resilient she wanted me to be somebody that can handle myself in these conditions Mm -hmm. and so she put me in certain scenarios which is wildly inappropriate you know fighting other kids that kind of stuff to develop these capacities and I hated her for it Mm -hmm. and but then getting going through life with that as I'm replaying that in my relationships I'm you know if there's a problem we resort to violence Mm. right with, you know, whether it's like friends or people who are just testing me outside my door. And it kept leading me into more problems, of course, because it wasn't really resolving any of this stuff. But getting to a place where I was able to forgive her for the situation she put me in, for the, the, you know, the abuse or whatever the case might be, the things that, that I went through and being, I literally, like when you said, you freeze and I just thought about all those times I got hit. Like mm-hmm. it was a regular occurrence, you know? And again, she, from her perspective, she, she loved me, you know? She wasn't trying to hurt me. She was trying to discipline me and make sure that I'm not doing these certain things so I could survive mm-hmm. in this environment. And so if I was to carry that with me, even today, it, I would suffer. I would be suffering still. And now, I have, and this is what I want to ask you about as mm-hmm. well, because we tend to look for those things to fill those spaces. Yep. And if we're doing this intentionally and from a place of, of healing, can it not be healthy to have some of these needs met from other relationships? Because I'm, not, I'm asking this because after forgiving my mom and like even that and truly forgiving her, it opened up this love for her, a different kind of love of like, thank you. Like, thank you so much for bringing me here. Thank you so much for keeping me safe in these particular environments to the best of your ability. Thank you so much for putting food on the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for selling your blood Mm -hmm. at times just to be able to feed us. Thank you so much, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the abuse that you had to endure. Mm And it became this very, but it was it was personal. Mm-hmm. It didn't necessarily change how I'm treating her, interacting with her, because she's still who she is. But it gave me freedom, and I have this new experience within myself where I'm not carrying all this resentment. And so now, now this is my question: As I 
processed a lot of these things. Then I met my wife. Mm -hmm. Funny thing, right? But with her, I met my mother-in-law. And those boxes that I was wanting to check, just, just to have a mom, just to have mm -hmm. somebody that I could count on that's there. I could just go to her house and she's there. Mm -hmm. I got that. And I'm, I'm curious if that is a healthy, because I'm intentional about it, mm -hmm. But I, I feel the need for that as well. I, I, I still feel that need for a love. I still feel that need for a mom. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all that. I just want to go back and grab that little boy and hug him <laughs> and be like, I got you. Yeah. So this is a beautiful example of a both and. <laughs> my, my current coach is always reminding me, both and, Christine, both and. Having the perspective to forgive your mother is a beautiful place of freedom to get to. Understanding her journey and what she went through through a child as a child and the intention behind a lot of her actions is a great place to get to inside yourself because it's spacious and you can let go a lot of, of a lot of that resentment, like you said, and move into that acceptance. So that's the the spiritual, I would say, side of this. The emotional side, would be going back to that little guy who was five, six, seven, something like that, if your brother was about five years younger, and saying, you know, what what were you really needing? You know, what did you want from mom that you didn't get? And what, what would his answer be? I just wanted her to hold me. Yeah. He's wanting to feel held and nurtured and safe and loved and like probably like so your nervous system could calm down. Yeah. Right. So being held, it's an instant. Oh, we go into to regulation. Right. So probably as a little kid, you had to be on high alert a lot of the time. So going into your mother-in-law's home right now probably is like being held. You know, it's probably yeah. a part of your nervous <laughs> system that just goes. Oh, and I'm not surprised that you have such a passion for health because so much of what you talk about is really about regulating your nervous system yeah. because this was such a huge need for you. So you've done it for your little boy, maybe not consciously, but by really creating environments for yourself that are safe. So you've taken care of him and you've brought experiences into your life that are giving you and him what he never had. So something you could do next time you walk into your mother-in-law's house is just check in with little Sean. Be like, hey, buddy, you're, you're here with me. You're coming with me. We're going to go in. We're going to get a big hug. And we're going to go into a warm house yeah. with yummy food. And we're just going to like let all that love in. So just like invite him along for that. And this is absolutely healthy. You know, we, yes, so much of our work is done independently. But like we said earlier, we are relational beings, we are interdependent, and expecting to do it all on our own is ridiculous. And so having experiences that fill those needs that we didn't get as children is deeply healing. But going in with an expectation mm -hmm. or projecting all our stuff on somebody, like if you subconsciously were projecting this mother wound on Anne, yeah. I don't think you'd still be married. You know, if you were looking to her to make you feel good, to make you feel safe, to, to regulate you, if you took no responsibility in your own life for learning how to regulate your system and get yourself out of chaos, it would be a problem in relationship. But you've taken responsibility for that. And you've probably done more inner child work than you, than you realize. <laughs> but I would just say, if I can just put on my coach hat for a second, Bring more consciousness to little Sean. Like let him be part of your now life more. Yeah, yeah. You know, the thing I love about you is like you point me to certain things that I do on accident, or seemingly on accident. Mm -hmm. But as you know, you know, just doing the work, investing in myself, working to figure things out, you know, working to feel good, to find happiness, to, to be more graceful, in in life and how i you know how i how i operate how i relate to other people how i relate to myself 
you happen upon certain things, you know, and one of those things too, you know, I, because I had to also be on my P's and Q's, like to make it out of the environment as well. I was very, even though I was a very kind of playful kid in the classroom, just like I'm on my, Mm -hmm. you know, and I feel, of course, and this is a lot of people experience this today, like countless kids where they they have the spirit of play and creativity and all the things and you just got to sit there and I push I like push myself through those scenarios and but now there is a there is an intentional spirit of play in my Mm -hmm. household in my environment that I encourage you know that I've encouraged through my actions and also just again wanting to provide a better blueprint yeah and now I gotta ask you about this what about when we swing the pendulum all the way to the other side? Because you started off by sharing that, you know, our nervous systems are looking for certain things to, to feel loved, to feel safe. Mm-hmm. And that questioning a hundred people, maybe five had those, had that condition. Now there's a lot of these adults walking around here who are, who are aware of this stuff and they're trying to do that for their kids. All love and safety all the time impossible <laughs> we're trying to yeah and I'm trying to maybe yeah. the, because there's this new term of helicopter parenting uh-huh. right maybe taking away some things of of resilience of adjustment of all you know fill in the blank mm-hmm. and so my question is can't where's the where's the balance here because yeah. that's what we really want we want to get to a place where we are a more integrated balanced human being yeah Well, (laughs) I love this question. And back when I used to, like 10 years ago, I used to speak a lot on the millennial generation, like 10, 15 years ago. And people would ask me about helicopter parenting. And I'd say, it's not helicopter, it's cockpit parenting. These parents are flying the planes for these kids. They're, They're not hovering. And that wasn't so great because kids didn't learn autonomy and resilience and rejection and learning how to deal with all those things. So some natural appropriate suffering is part of the healthy development of the child and the human being. What I notice when the pendulum swings the other way is that a parent is so uncomfortable with their own big feelings and their own suffering that they can't handle it and can't stay regulated when their child is suffering or have big feelings. So one of the biggest things we do as parents is to stay regulated the best we can when our child is dysregulated and not try to get them out of their pain, not rescue them all the time. Let them fall on their face and just be like, I'm here and I love you. What do you wanna talk about about this? As long as you're that safe, consistent space, that is actually way more important and will create a way more adapted human being than fixing all their problems. Because we fix our kids' problems because we're uncomfortable with them. It's, believe me, I'm only 20 months into parenting, so I am no expert. But it is one of the hardest things is just to see her struggle and see her suffer. And, but I know it's part of, it's part of being human and it's part of how she develops resilience. So, yeah, having no boundaries, I I don't think is love and safety at all. To me, love and truth go together. And we, we need boundaries. We need like, you know, a lot of times when Athena's really upset about something, you know, I showed you that video of how she likes to drive. And sometimes it's time to get out of the car and she does not want to get out of the car. And we talk about it and I say, okay, I can see you don't want to get out of the car. Now I'm going to lift you out of the car because it is time to go in. And you can be mad at me. Like I see, oh, you're really mad at me. Yeah, you're really, really mad at me. That's okay. You can be mad. and. She's just mad and that's just okay, you know? And the other thing I noticed so much, especially with the previous generation of parenting is really wanting kids to like us, like being a little more invested in our children liking us than setting those boundaries and really being the parent. But in order to parent, and again, there's no perfection with parenting. You know, just like Gottman says in his workshops, and his research on marriage and on relationships. It's not about being perfect, it's not about never fighting, it's about repair. 
Same thing with attachment parenting. It's not about being perfect. It's about being consistent. And it's about repairing when things kind of go off the rails. So there's, there's no perfection. But having that intention to be consistent, to have those boundaries, and to do your own work. Because we talked about relationship triggering us. Woo! Kids are really great at showing us our unprocessed stuff as well. They're <laughs> excellent at it. <laughs> They're masters. Yeah, they are. Masters. So you've said this term expectation a couple of times, and uh, this is one of the uh, really seminal works that you've shared with everybody is the expectation hangover, right? And, you know, so again, it's not, the problem isn't addressing your needs through relationship. That's normal. The problem is holding these expectations and and putting that off on another person, mm -hmm. right? So can you talk a little bit about expectation hangovers? Like, what is that? Well, it's, it's one of three things. Either something that you really wanted or planned or worked hard for doesn't happen, or something that you really wanted does happen, but it doesn't make you feel the way you thought you would. Like, you finally get that great job or get into that relationship, but your insecurity issues are still there. Or life just throws you an unexpected curveball. You know, someone breaks up with you, diagnosed with an illness, layoff, those types of things. So in a nutshell, it's disappointment. It is. And in relationships, so much of expectations are projection. So much of expectations are, you know, this is what I didn't get or this is what I'm not giving myself. And so I'm going to project it on you subconsciously or consciously. And it's mm. your job to give it to me. And another thing that we do in relationships is we really expect the person to be a mind reader and to know what it's like to walk in our shoes. You know, so and when we when I do couples work with people, the, the thing that I work hardest on with people is to get them in the other person's shoes, to really like look at how someone else sees the world. Because we all have a very distinct way of seeing the world. We all have a very distinct opinion about how things should go and how someone should act, especially our partner. And our partner can see things completely, completely different. And so, so many of our expectations are unspoken and then that just leads to resentment. So my biggest thing in relationship is one, please don't expect your partner to be a mind reader. Like don't, even if you've been together 50 years and you think that on your anniversary, he should know you like flowers. Don't expect it. Just be like, I'm really looking forward to the flowers this year. I wonder what this year you're gonna get me. You know, t t take control, <laughs> you know, take responsibility for not getting disappointed. And something I hear so often from couples is, oh my gosh, I don't wanna have to tell my partner what I need. And I said, well then prepare to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> You know, like take responsibility. And yes, there is room for pleasant surprises. And I do think as a partner, we do want to anticipate the other person's needs. Like that's a big thing too. But the more responsibility you take, the more responsibility your partner's going to take if you're in a healthy dynamic. But yeah, those expectations, man, they just lead to a lot of resentment. Yeah, yeah. And it can show up, as you said earlier, like so much of our physical ailments have an emotional component. And yeah, you know, it's just, it's the expectation that oftentimes is a thing that we're carrying physically as well. Um, my stepfather passed away recently. Mm. And when I got the news and I, I was having a good day, yeah. all right? But also this, we knew that this was imminent. You know, he'd been on assisted living for like 12 years. He had some uh, cognitive stuff from drugs and you know and then things kind of took a turn for the worse more recently and um, I got the news and then within the hour I started having a pain in my neck uh -huh. and it just got progressively work and I did all the things you know I'm like working on it I got all the different equipment and the you know and I'm, I'm hitting it all these kind of ways and then it kind of resolved a little bit it was like I could turn my head a little bit easier and the next day it was on the other side <laughs> it's just like oh, I'm just gonna move yeah. over here yeah. and I I felt like initially because I didn't do the self-inquiry that it was because of the news and I was holding on to it mm. but it wasn't that at all mm. because I felt on again it's kind of like with my mom I felt this joyful like this gratitude and this beauty and all these other things and I'm just like 
am I missing something? And I was, did the inquiry. And I just like, this isn't what it is. And it wasn't until, again, the importance of relationships, I talked with a trusted advisor mm -hmm. and it was Michael Beckwith. Mm. And I told him about the situation, how I was feeling, because I even took that with me because we were leaving for Maui like oh. two days later. I was I had a pain in my neck in, in paradise. Yeah. I had the Lumi Lumi massage. All, nothing could get rid of it, right? It could just make it so more functional, but the pain was still there. And after I shared with him finally, a week later almost, what it was and just the context of things, you know, my brother and sister and the call and whatever, and I'm about to head back to St. Louis. It was, it was what I was carrying, the expectation about my brother and sister and how they were going to respond and how they were acting and all the things. It was my expectation. He was like, the expectation is the problem. He said mm -hmm. specifically that word, the expectation mm -hmm. is the problem. Mm -hmm. And once I got to look at it, and I just, mm -hmm. I, I honored the fact that it was there. I realized it, I saw it. I, I looked at why and I let it go. Mm. I let it go. And I stopped that silly behavior I was putting myself through of holding these expectations over mm. these grown people's behavior. Mm. And I just let it go. And within mm -hmm. 24 hours, the pain was gone. Wow. And it was, it was a mental reframe, you mm -hmm. know, something I was caring about an expectation. And so I deeply, deeply see this. And so I want to ask you about this. So yesterday, my youngest son was writing. It was a question for, you know, this particular thing he had to do. And the question was, what do you like most about your identity? And I'm just like, he's coming to me as like, like what are they talking about? Mm -hmm. And I was just giving him some examples about what his identity is. It's a big question. And I got to see his answer later on. I was blown away. And he started off, he has his, and I love the fact that he communicates as he talks. And I'm trying to keep that encouragement going. And he, he answered the question, he, he started off saying, I'm not gonna lie, but the thing that I like most about my identity is that I care about people. Oh. And then he went on to describe different scenarios and how he does this. And he shared, even he even added a story in there about his mm -hmm. birthday party. One of his friends wasn't happy, wasn't feeling like they were included. And at his own, he was like, at my own birthday party, I stopped everything to make sure that my friend felt included. Mm. And, and then, but also I start to feel a little bit of something unsettling as I'm reading at this point, mm -hmm. because this is about others. Mm -hmm. And then boom, the next sentence, he was like, but also of course I've got to make sure that I'm taking care of my happiness because that's going to impact how I, how I communicate with other people, right? And he was like kind of throwing that back to the question answerer, right? Mm -hmm. Just like, I'm included in this too. Mm -hmm. And so to have both of those mm -hmm. is my question. Um, having that self input and also if we're working to give something to others, like I guess my question is how do we find that balance? Because it's so easy to be so other focused or so easy to be so self-centered Mm -hmm. Like, how do we find that balance? I know this is a big question as well. Yeah. I mean, I love your son. How remarkable. Um, I don't know, Sean, that there is a balance. I think it's more about an order of things. So, and, and, and I love that they're asking him about identity because I mentioned Erickson's stages of development and the psychosocial stage of development he is, is identity and role confusion, like really figuring out who he is in the world. So beautiful that you know, this question is being asked. So much of how we think of ourselves is how other people perceive us. And that's just natural. That's just a natural part of being human. And I do think that, I'm sure this is true for me, I'm sure it's true for you, the older you get, the less you kind of care, you know? And it's, it's tremendous freedom. But it seems like as we're younger, what other people think it really does matter because we're back to that need of belonging. We're back to that need of like, where do I fit in the world? And he's still trying to figure it out. And right. he's found a recipe for fitting in. And part of how I fit in the world is I help other people. So what I mean by the order of things is where that gets troublesome is if he is giving from a place of depletion. Right. Yeah. Like if his own cup isn't full. Like if he was having a great old time at his birthday party and his needs were met and he is like, oh, well, like this person doesn't seem like they're doing well. I'm going to go over and see what they're doing. That's a different come from 
then, oh my gosh, someone isn't having a good time and it's my responsibility to make sure they're okay. Mm. Much different come from. So that's what I think we need to be aware of is both the order of things of like, am I full? Am I coming from a resourced place? And that's more of an adult question. And what's my come from in doing something, you know? Is it because I think I need to do this because this is how I belong in the world? Or is it really coming from a heartfelt desire of like, yeah, this feels really good to me to do this? I love that so much to come from. And even us big adult babies, we could pay attention to that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's something I've had to just be so mindful of in my work because I hear day after day, like really difficult stuff, you know? And there is a part of me that just wants to go in and mother everybody and save everybody. But I would, I, I'd be sick by now if I, if I did that. And so we have to learn empathy is not sympathy. Sympathy has a feeling sorry for and a judgment tone to it. And like, I need to, you know, something's wrong with you and I need to help you in some way. Um, and I feel sorry for you. Empathy is just, I'm with you. I see you and I'm with you. Compassion, co means with, passion means suffering, the original definition. That's compassion, just really being with it. So that's one of the things, especially people that may have developed a strategy early on to be a people pleaser or a caretaker, because that's one of the programming. If I take care of other people, then I get love, then I get validation, then I belong, then people need me, I won't be left. Like there's a whole, there's a lot of perks to being a caretaker and a people pleaser. So we have to really look at like, again, where is that come from? All right, this is awesome. So I wanna ask you, this is also from your personal experience recently too, mm. you know? If people are wanting to find that love and maybe they've gone through again all the stuff and you know some things didn't work out how they want recently. So if you could share your recent experience in meeting your husband mm. and starting a family and all the things and the season of life that you were in where yeah. again some of these things for some people it's like that's not even possible yeah can you talk a little about that yeah well i mean last time we recorded i hadn't met my husband it was beginning yeah. of 2018 and i met him well we were introduced in april we didn't meet till july yeah, so I was married in my late 20s, divorced in my early 30s when everybody else was getting married and having babies. I was definitely doing things on the wrong timeline. And before my divorce, I had a broken engagement. So by 32, I was, you know, two engagements in. One one called off the wedding six months before, and the other one, we got a divorce. So, and I was a coach at the time with self-help books. So I felt like such, I was like, oh, am I really qualified to do this? Um, but I knew that I was because I was really honoring my truth. And one thing I really learned about relationships is that the success of a relationship is not based on how long it lasts. It's really based on what did you learn from it and how much did you heal. And I can say with my ex-husband, we both learned a lot and there was a lot of healing that happened and it had an expiration date. Like there was an end to what we needed to learn and grow together. And some relationships just have those. And so my 30s were very single, like very single. Oh, by choice for a while and then I was like all right well this is a little boring like it's a little lonely my bed's a little cold like is, any, is anybody out there hello so it was, it was a tough time and I really had to look at all right like where do I still have patterns of protection running and what I realized Sean and and it's even been more profound with my daughter love on some level is terrifying like when you when we really let love in, like a partner or a child, oh my God. It's like so huge. It's so huge. And because I had been hurt, I didn't want to risk it. I just did not want to risk it. And so I had walls up. I pretended I was open and I said I was open, but I had walls up because I just didn't want to get hurt again. I didn't want to go through pain and rejection again. And so, I mean, there's tactical things I did that we can talk about, but the biggest shift for me was two things. One being like, I, am a, I will get hurt again. I will take the risk and I will open my heart. And if I get hurt again, if I get that big expectation hangover, I'll navigate my way through it. So I'm like open to love. 
I had to do the same thing when I opened up to getting pregnant. And the other thing was surrender. I had to let go of thinking I was going to make it happen. I had to let go of my list. I had to let go of trying so hard to make it work. And I really had to trust the universe and surrender. And I learned how to be with a longing without suffering. Because I think sometimes people confuse surrender with resignation. Resignation is whatever, why bother, I give up. There's no good people out there. It's not going to happen for me. I'm happy on my own. That's resignation. That's not surrender. True surrender is not letting go of the longing. It's like trusting the universe, but letting the longing be there. So I let myself long for love. I let myself long for partnership, but not suffer at the same time not make it mean anything was wrong with me not make it mean time was running out and this is like approaching 40 like I was right there at that like clock that so many women people but especially women feel and learn how to be with the desire without the hurt and the focus on the lack and so the the story is um I was I was moved to San Diego had this great place on the beach that I loved, went to renew my lease. Landlord said, nope, I'm kicking you out. I'm like, what? 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 Massive expectation hangover. Had no idea why. Was just a nomad. I think before we recorded, I was on my way to Australia. I was traveling all over. And this is when I really stepped into that surrendering. I'm like, okay, universe, you just kicked me out of my dream home. Like, what the fuck is going on? Okay, I surrender. How much more do I need to surrender? I really surrender here. And then I was over at a friend's house and her husband was working on his computer and he said, hey, Christine, can you come and look at this startup website we're working on? And on the screen were the founders and I looked at this face and I said, I know him, who is that? And he said his name and I'm like, well, that's a name. It's Stefano Safandos. I mean, that's a name. Never heard of him. I just had this soul recognition. I was in San Diego. He was in Perth, Australia. We couldn't be on more opposite sides of the world. Our friends asked if we could they could introduce us and this is also this was another thing I did I got super clear because I had a pattern of going for emotionally unavailable super charismatic life of the party very good looking successful men but they were not available for relationship at the level that I wanted and I just kept thinking that I can change them (laughs) (laughs) expectation hangover waiting do happen so I was super clear I told my friend Ask him if he's calling in a relationship. His queen, his wife, use whatever word you want to use. But I'm only, I don't want a pen pal. And I don't want a guy who's like just dating a lot. I I want someone who is wanting sacred union and wants a conscious partnership. Otherwise, please don't introduce us. So I also was like, I did not waver on my non-negotiables. Because that was something I had done in the past. I was like, well, eh, it's really cute. That's okay. And finally, I got, well, how am I going to really get what I want if I'm wavering, you know? So, and that that comes from fear, too. We think, oh, I can't possibly have everything I want. So, I'll just take this thing and maybe I can change it. So, anyway, I'll wrap this story up. He said yes. We got introduced. We talked for two and a half months over WhatsApp. We met in Greece. And at 9 o'clock in the morning, he flew in. I opened my hotel room door. And I was like, okay, I'm home. That's it. He hugged me and I just had, I didn't have fireworks. I didn't have that feeling that was like a drug that had just ended in a dead end and lots of tears so many previous times. I had a feeling of home, of like, oh, this is safe and my nervous system regulated. And that's a huge cue for relationships when you first meet someone. Those fireworks are fun. And there's a lot of adrenaline and dopamine that can happen. But what what you really want to feel is a sense of like, whew, I'm intrigued and I'm attracted. And I'm also like, I feel safe with you. And I also, I had to get to a feeling of safety inside myself to, to be able to do that. So we met, we got married three months later <laughs> after we met in person. And then we had our daughter in 20, so we met in 2018 and we had our daughter in 2022 um and that was another thing sean that i was like oh gosh do i want this like can i handle loving something so much like can i because one of my things my kryptonite oh i worry 
I worry with the best of them. And it's something that I have just accepted about myself and I've learned ways to work with it. Um, but especially people I love, oof, I can worry to, uh, I can make up amazing worst case scenarios and just my hypervigilance can really kick in. And I was like, oh, can I, can I deal with loving something that much? Can I really? And, but then when I really felt into it, I asked myself, do I want to make a decision from fear? Because that's what I'm doing right now. I'm making a decision from fear, not from possibility, definitely not from love. So I asked myself, like, if I go in and make a decision from love, what do I want? And I wanted to be a mom. And I got pregnant in my 40s easily, naturally, which was another thing people say wouldn't happen, you know, and ended up having a home birth because the doctors I went to treated me like a sick person being pregnant in my 40s. You know, and um, I'm like, no, we're not doing that. So I had her at home, no issues. And, you know, I never thought when I got divorced at, I don't know how old I was, 31, 32, that I'd wait 10 years, you know, to have the marriage and the child that I always thought I wanted. And I would have thought, no, that's not possible or that's too late. And what I've learned from my own life and doing this with so many people is there's divine timing for things. And it's really never too late for things. You know, and some people may say, well, it's too late for me to have a child. Like, not going to happen. Well, form is, you know, we can look at form, right? If you want to be a parent, like if you want to be a mother or a father, how else can you express that? Having a bi biological child isn't the only way to express that. No, that was something I came to peace with is if I wasn't able to get pregnant and I wasn't able to have a child, well, all the ways that I do mother, you know, and I'd... I'd grieve not being able to do that but there are other ways to express that and i think that's a trap we fall into in life as we we look at what we're lacking we look at what we don't have versus really looking and creating the feeling because we're always after the feeling we're never after the form anyway that part that part you're amazing this is so cool um wow Thank you so much, truly, for sharing your story and for traveling. This is big for you, even yeah. to come here right now, because you know, with your connection with your daughter right now, and I don't take it lightly at all. This is really like you've given so much today, like, and even just for me, mm. like I think you see both of our eyes up here just watering, mm. and um, yeah, thank you so much for doing this work, and thank you for sharing your vulnerability as well because one of the coolest parts was when you shared you know the struggles in your early relationships and you being in this work and just like is this am i not good at this and it's just like getting face to face with oh this is what this is yeah. because what so many of us think is that there again is this certain perfect story this perfect scenario yeah. and no matter who you aspire to be or who you might model or think highly of they go through yep. all right some of the wildest some of the most crazy scenarios no matter where we are what what you know um what our story has been previously there's there's always something there's always something and so you giving us the ability to uh, self-assess for ourselves and also the wherewithal that listen the divine timing piece being able to get clear on what you want being able to surrender, being able to keep walking in that direction, being the person doing the things, and ultimately accepting, like a big part of your story too, was accepting this love, accepting all these different conditions, and being able to look at, which is so huge for so many of us I know, that fear of getting hurt. Yeah. And like accepting it, that it's part of the package. Yeah. And even, I'm a fan of celebrating things like that as well. Like, mm -hmm. listen, my wife and I, we've been together for almost 20 years, for 19 years. And I made a decision because there was this whole like uh, non-attachment thing, mm. right? Like there's certain meditations in different camps, just letting, be, be not attached. Right. And that's one way to be. but. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm a scientist too. So yeah, I'm like, yeah. you know, we are social creatures and the, the chemistry and all the things are just like, yeah. that doesn't make sense. Yeah. So let me get the best of both worlds. Let me consciously 
attach to this person and allow myself to be swayed, the, the waves of my life, to yeah. be influenced by this person's presence and her decisions and open myself up to being hurt, which I know she's going to hurt me, and that's okay. Yeah. And also trusting that she's going to work on being better for me as I'm working on being better for her. But the last piece is, you said this in the very beginning, expectations versus responsibility. Yeah. Right? So taking responsibility for myself first and foremost. And you are a huge example of this. Like, I want everybody to follow you like crazy. Mm -hmm. Where, what's the best places people can connect with you and connect with your work? And you also mentioned that you and your husband do some work together as well. So let's Yeah, we do. We do. There's just something that I, I feel I really want to say. Can I say one thing Absolutely. before please I go into do. that? Please do. Okay. So um, I've been in the personal development work for a long time. And there's a time and a place for it. And I think what what a trend that I'm seeing that I just want to speak to briefly because what you were saying just brought, triggered a bell. And we talked a lot about inner child work and we talked about some deep work that sometimes the best thing we can do is like just get ourselves regulated and resourced again. So something I see a lot of people do is like they, I gotta get, dig deep and I gotta solve this issue and we need to, our relationship needs to go to therapy right now. We need to like uncover all these things and unpack all these things. and. I need to do this workshop and then take this course and read this book and all these things and and that's all great but it can also like reactivate trauma <laughs> so there's an ebb and a flow to growth personal development work whatever we want to say where sometimes especially if you've just been through a lot the best thing you can do is get resourced again get regulated again it often isn't the time to go do deep somatic work or go to a really cathartic workshop where a lot of stuff's going to come up it's the time to do your breath work not holotropic but do breath work that really regulates your nervous system get your acupuncture feel supported body work those types of things because when we go into and this is tying it to relationships when we go into anything unresourced and depleted we're just going to get triggered really, really easily. Yeah. So for people individually, or if you feel like your relationship is just in a, a rut right now, before you start digging, what can you bring, to, what can you do to bring yourself back into regulation? What can you do to resource yourself and the relationship? And then from there, mm -hmm. that's when you do the, the deeper work. So thank you for indulging me in that. I just wanted to, to say that. Um, contact me well there's lots of ways i'm on instagram i just released the audiobook to expectation hangover the first version wasn't my voice so i recorded it in my voice and put some put some extra things in there and then my husband and i do teach an inner child workshop that's available anytime it's self-paced it's just christinehassler.com slash inner child and then my podcast which you've been on so it's a coaching podcast so every wednesday is a life coaching podcast if you're confused about inner child work, listen to the podcast, you'll hear me do it. And then every Saturday is an episode with someone awesome like you. So lots of ways to connect. Yeah, it's such a good show. Such oh, a good show. You. I love doing it. Well, thank you so much again for making the time. You know, this is like, this is such a special part of my day today, straight oh, up. Me I too. I appreciate it. Well, there are very few people that I would fly for 16 hours <laughs> to be with and i just have so much respect and appreciation for you sean as a as a father as a husband as a leader as somebody who's really walking the talk and integrating the work like this was a no-brainer for me to come yeah well real recognize real so <laughs> i appreciate you so much yeah Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. It's been information withheld from us for a very long time, and it is behind so much frustration, misunderstandings, and the orgasm gap, which is a, it's a big abyss that like not even the world's like greatest daredevil could jump it.